Since we started this festival five years ago, one of the people we always wanted to come, as he knows, oh. I've basically been stalking him for half a decade, so uh, the, the motto being eventually they'll give in. And then he wrote a book, so his excuses ran out. So here we are, Edward Enninfall, uh, well known as the editor-in-chief of British Vogue, the European editorial director of Vogue, your global ambassador for the Prince's Trust. He is without doubt a legend in the fashion industry. The first man, the first black person, the first gay person to edit Vogue. He's been, you've been on the cover of Time magazine. You've won many, many awards. And in the five years you've been editing, you haven't just been you know, superbly creative with fashion, which you have always been, and been such, you know, it's it set a new benchmark for inclusivity and diversity, but you've also shown, I found, a very sort of kind of touching and impressive sensitivity to the public mood. So when you put key workers on the cover during the pandemic, and it's like, oh, there's somebody who works in a supermarket on the cover of Vogue. And then you went into sort of Hockney and the art covers. And now this current stunning cover, the purple one you've done in memory of the Queen, oh. you know, and, and just a little thing that you wrote um, in, in this month's issue, you said British Vogue itself was already 10 years old when the Queen was born in, ten, in 1926. Um, during her record-breaking reign, she was, by the time of her coronation, the fourth monarch in the magazine's life. And you said, in a rare tribute, Royal Purple envelops this month's special commemorative cover for the first time since 1952. And, you know, such Britishness, and I know you, you've had an award from Her Majesty. You've got all these celebrity friends who were married at Longleat, and yet... Behind that is a whole another very surprising and very moving and human story um, which you've written in this wonderful book, A Visible Man, which, as I, I was saying to you earlier, it will have you laughing, it will have you crying. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a real tour de force. So tell me about the, the beginning of the book, your friend Idris Elba, yeah. Uh, and you <laughs> go for a walk in yeah. lockdown, and he says, you meet so many amazing people, you've yeah. got to write a book. But yeah, I mean, I was, you know, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for the brilliant introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, so I remember, you know, we were in lockdown. Everybody was sort of, didn't know what the, what the world was going through, what was going to happen. And I remember t I was with Idris and... We're walking through Hyde Park, you know, on those walks. And I remember saying, I think I'm going to write about my life, to write my memoir. And he was very, you know, Idris, I don't know if you've met him, but he was very like, <laughs> my man. <laughs> my man. <laughs> what we want from you is, you know, you walk with, you know, kings and the most beautiful women. We need those stories. And I was, I remember saying to him, I would love to write about that, it's a part of my life, but that's not my story, that's not just it. The story is not all about the glamorous side of life, but you know, a life that's been quite, quite difficult too. So that's how we started. Amazing. So you start off, you're born in Ghana, and yes. it's a place that sounds to me half magical and half terrifying. Yeah. It's got this undercurrent of sort of trouble, and yet, your descriptions, your early descriptions, particularly of your mother and your aunts and your siblings are so wonderful. Will you just tell us a little bit about your, your strongest memories of your childhood there? I mean, my strongest memories of my childhood was really sort of growing up around my mother. My mother was a seamstress. I mean, she was incredible. She had a great eye for, for, for clothes, you know, style. And so I remember that I had five siblings, so a lot of noise in the house, you know, running around. And we grew up on a military base. You know, we grew up, I grew up in Ghana, but on a military base in a town, because my dad was in the army. Um, he was a major, Major Enenfall. So it was quite surreal. But I remember, you know, through the happy days, we also lived opposite uh, the sea. And there were these mounds, sort of, before you got to the water and they had these sticks on them. So we'd be running around every Sunday, we're like, oh my God, it's firing squad day. 
At Farris Court, there really is when you, they would march sort of people up the hill, sort of covered, and essentially execute them. But when you're a child, that just became like, hey, it's Farris Squad Day. <laughs> right? So I think my mother sort of clicked that this might not be the best thing, so we moved. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Let's go. So we moved to another town. But she was much more than a seamstress, wasn't she? She had a proper atelier. Yes, yes. And tell us a bit about that, because you saw, you know, in, in your childhood, you saw the workings of yeah. the, of a fashion industry, really. Yeah, I mean, she had forty. What we call what she called apprentices. Okay. You know, yeah. they would all come from diff all over Ghana, learn to sew, and then they'll go off to sort of um, to their own careers. So I just remember lots of noise always. My mother sort of instructing, designing, you know, I'll be hiding in the room, helping her sort of zip women. If you know Ghanaian clothes, they're quite, they're quite something. <laughs> Shoulders out to here, you know, really wigs up to there. And it was just so magical for me. And I loved women. And, you know, people always talk about, you know, even at Vogue, well, yeah. where do you get this love of, you know, women? And it's just my mother in, that, in those fittings you know women of all sizes all shapes my first memory of beauty in women really wasn't sort of the eurocentric idea of the thing it was like big hips and right. big breasts and <laughs> you know beautiful women yeah. really, different shapes and sizes yeah. so i really remember that as being an early memory and she dressed the president's wife didn't she did you yeah, go the with her to the wife. palace and the, yeah. yeah she was very she was very well regarded, let's say. And she was just so good, so damn good. I mean, the eye for colors, sort of oranges with greens, unexpected colors. And, and I just sat there soaking it in. And, you know, and the thing about Africa is, you know, when women get together, they really gossip. <laughs> so there'll be full Never. gossip, midstream, and they'll look around and there'll be little Edward in the corner. And somebody would go, go get a cup of coffee or whatever. And then you, they, they send you out, and I'll be behind the door, still <laughs> learning about the secrets of women. So yeah. really great days, oh, really happy God. memories. Yeah. Yeah. But you also had a sort of, you were, also you describe yourself as the family librarian. Yeah. And you had a little, tell us about your little school. <laughs> well, I, was, I always wanted to be a teacher, so they used to call me teacher. <laughs> and I remember I, I would always line up little stones, yeah. you know outside in the sun, and I was a teacher teaching the stones, and they'll get detention out, <laughs> and you know, they'll get high marks, and they right. will dance together, but it was a whole... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you have a favorite yes. stone? Was there was confirmation bias? Yeah. The ones? Well behaved stones, badly yeah. behaved ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. expelled ones, yeah. you know, they were all there. Yeah, that's your first editing job, really, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> But the teacher, yeah, I, you know, I always thought I was going to end up being a teacher, actually. Yeah, well, I guess well, in a way I am. Yeah, right? I was going to say, you sort of are. Yeah. And so, so go on, a, and then it all comes to a very sudden end. So what happened? You suddenly had to leave. It's about a... Yeah, I mean, moment, so. in Ghana, there were you know, a lot of what we call military coups. So one president will be in office, and then there'll be a coup, and then they'll be killed, and another one will come in. And my father was very close to president of the time, President Champon, and he was executed. And one day to the next, he had to flee Ghana. And I remember coming home from school, and he was gone. And my relationship with my father in the book wasn't the easiest. So I thought, well, he's gone, so great. And uh, <laughs> what I didn't realize that yeah. his life was in, was in danger, and his cousin, another Colonel Enenful, had been sort of killed at his breakfast table. So he left, and then a year later, we left with no papers. We just all banded together on a plane, and it was during, before Margaret Thatcher issued the, sort of, the law that, you know, the people from the Commonwealth yes, now had yes. to have passports yes, or visas sure. or whatever. We didn't know, we just left. Yeah, right. And then we got to Gatwick Airport, we were detained for hours. Oh God, how terrifying. Right. Oh, we were happy. We, were, we, we thought it was all oh. a game. Oh, okay. We thought it was all a game, playing, and then... Is this you and all your siblings? Pardon? And you and yeah, siblings? Yeah, five siblings. Right. Really happy to be there, you know. We'd never been outside of Ghana. And I remember, at one point, one of my brothers turning to me, and we go, oh my God. 
It's white people everywhere. <laughs> we've never seen them before. We've never seen white people before. We've seen a couple in Ghana. Yeah. So it was a real surprise, let's say. Yeah. yeah. How old were you? You were like 13. 13. And did you know about London? What did you know of London? Well, I mean, you... before we came, you know, I'd been reading sort of, I don't know if you remember Smash Hits on number one. <laughs> sort of, and I was obsessed with Boy George. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Of course, now I know why. But back then, I had no idea. He was a man in makeup, dresses, and I was obsessed with Boy George. And I was like, I'm going to go to London, I'm going to meet Boy George. <laughs> He's a friend of mine. He doesn't know this story, by the way. I think he does yeah. now. Um, but I, I loved all the pop stars, and I loved sort of Spandau Ballet and the whole sort of new romantic thing happening in England. So I thought so we, were, you know, we were coming to meet pop stars and the right. Queen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> As it turned out. But the, it, the contrast was really acute, wasn't it? Because in Ghana, you know, father had been a major and as traumatic as it was, you'd been in boarding school, yes. hadn't you? You'd been in the equivalent of a big Based on the English school. system, yeah. Yeah, what was that like? The boarding well, school you know, was I key. went to boarding school for a year before we right. left and it was, you know, the same, you know, hazing, oh. um, you know, <laughs> being, a, oh, it's a good one, the prefects, yeah. the fags. Right. <laughs> I mean, really old. Yeah, terminology. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just really based on the English system, sure. and I hated it. Yeah, I wanted to be home with my mother. You know, oh, the so fact, being away from her was really sort of the worst sort thing of that could happen. Middle class, uncomfortable life, yeah. and then in England, everything's completely different. Yeah. So you come out of Gatwick, yeah. and then so we come out of Gatwick. We're on the train. <laughs> you know, we. Yeah. My dad had a little bed sit in, um, actually near where I live now, right. Lancaster Gate. Right. So we couldn't yeah. stay there, so we went to my aunt's flat in Vauxhall. Yes. And we saw all this brutalist architecture through the window. We got out, and I remember my brother, you know, had those fumes coming from his mouth. And I was like, oh my God, it must be because you ate eggs. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we knew about England. Yeah. And we yeah. all sort of squashed into two bedrooms in Vauxhall. But we were just so happy. I didn't know we were poor, but we were very poor. And then um, from Vauxhall, we moved opposite another barracks, um, Chelsea right. House in Victoria. And then we moved to Labrador Grove. And then you moved to Labrador Grove. You know, but we were always stopped. sharing rooms. And tell us about school. I love the, your description. So you, you know, suddenly arrive at an English state school, and then, but there are these fabulous girls. You talk, you've got oh this God, very I, vivid description yeah. of your female so, friends. So we came There's to a, England, and we, we enrolled at Lillian Bailey School in South London. Right. Yeah. And of course, I went in, you know, I had the big afro. I mean, I was a nerd. <laughs> big, I mean, these glasses are big now, but can you imagine when you were younger? Lillian Bailey School, and I fell in love with three girls. And I remember June Bailey, Dawn Kelly, and then I'm Anne Marie. Anne Marie Johnson, it was the moment when Sade was the queen. Right. Yeah. And I would literally stare at these girls as much same as I did with my mum's friends. Yeah, right. And they had slicked her big earrings. I mean, if you remember Sade, big braids. Yeah. yeah. And I remember they always had these pencil skirts and they would just they would waddle. Right. They wouldn't walk. <laughs> they would waddle, but I was obsessed with them. <laughs> and so yeah. they kind of saved me from bullying. You know, every time somebody tried to attack me, you know, they were so pretty. Even back then, I had a thing for pretty girls. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll, you know, I was, I was safe. But it was amazing being in another country, you know, a new land. I always say, you know, this duality I have comes from that period. You know, at home, we were in Ghana, Ghanaian food, you know, Ghanaian language, Ghanaian smells. And when I left, I was in England, you know, at school, eating fish and chips, you know. Bunking of school, whatever they called it back then. So this duality has really stayed with me. And Major Enemful wants you to be a lawyer, yeah. and that's not going to happen, is it? So how do we go from these wonderful girlfriends? So you're very young and you're yeah. tipped into fashion. So can you describe that kind of? Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, they were... in most African families, you know, they they want you to have an academic career, be a lawyer or a doctor. Yeah. So growing up, that was really drilled yeah. into me. And I was sort of quite good at school. And I remember when I, <laughs> I was stopped on the train when I was 16 to be a model. By OK, a so gentleman. that is a diff sort of sliding doors moment in your life, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it really changed my life. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was going to be a lawyer because my dad said yeah. so. My dad was very strict, very Ghanaian, 
I was quite scared of him, actually. And then I remember, you know, being stopped on a train to be a model, and the first time I walked onto a shoot, I just, something clicked in my head, and I knew this was what I was going to do. I didn't know, I didn't know fashion, I didn't know, you know, much about fashion. Before, I'd just been going to W.A. Smith's, you know, with the magazine oh, yes. rolled up. Leave it and steal another one. <laughs> and I did that for years. I mean, when I was writing the book, my, the lawyer literally said, maybe W.A. Smith could still sue you. So I had to take that out. <laughs> but I was just, my mind was blown by this new world. This, this world of media that I never knew existed. My parents didn't really understand either. Tell us about your modeling days. So I know you made some great friends in your modeling days. I think you almost, you have all these siblings, but you get a whole extra family, don't you, in, in, from modeling. So you, this is when you meet Kate and Naomi and... Yeah. What, what was it? What yeah, was I mean, you know, modeling was fun in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. I met Kate at a casting when mm. I was, yeah, I was 16 and she was 14. And I met Naomi a few years later. And we were so young, all just, you know, wide-eyed. We wanted to show the world. I was very Portobello at the time, very Lubbock Grove. We wanted to show the world, you know, that we weren't part of the 80s brigade with the, with the big hair and the big shoulders and power dressing. And we were, you know, Portobello market. We were cooler, you know, we lived in squats and flats and we photographed each other and, you know, dirty beaches, but that was our reality. And um, it's amazing to watch Kate, Naomi, Pat McGrath, everyone become, become such icons. But back in the day, we were just like, let's just have fun. Let's try to outdo each other. You know, we didn't have much money. So customi customizing really was the thing. You've got right. a pair of jeans from Hyper Hyper. I don't know if you remember Hyper Hyper. Or yeah. High Street, it's Kansas Market, and you customised it, and that became sort of a one-man, you know, one-upmanship. Yeah. Yeah. And you, I think one of your strengths, as many strengths as a stylist, is that you include the sort of the models in your work, yeah. don't you? You know, they're, they're not objectified by you there. Yeah, they're sort of in the, the reason why I sort of have a different relationship with models is I remember modelling, and, and, you know, if you want to feel very unattractive, if you want to feel very insecure, then be a model. Because no matter how, no matter how good looking you think you are, there's someone better. And whenever you go to a casting, they will remind you that you're no. not good enough. So basically, my teenage years was like being rejected, rejected, rejected. So I know what models go through. I know it's not the easiest job. People look at models and they think, oh, they have the world yeah. at their feet. But there's so much insecurities that come with that. And also, you know, a lot of sort of mistreatment. So I mm. always try to look after mm. not just the models, but my subjects generally. In the, through your book, there's lots of sort of kind of mentory inspiration figures. So these sort of, you know, various people, and then, you, you know, so the, then ID magazine. Yeah. So you meet Terry Jones, and you start so young, this incredible sort of career. I mean, you're 18 when 18, you're first yeah. putting that magazine together. Yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, I started. So I started modeling, and then right. I met Simon Foxton, and then I'll go and shoot, and I started to learn about, you, just you know, I loved me. clothes anyway from my mother. Tell everyone who Simon Foxton is. I mean, just Simon Foxton is an incredible so human being, my yeah. God. Simon Foxton was one of sort of the most prolific stylists in the 80s, mm. right? 80s London, ID Magazine. Um, Irene, and he was the one who stopped me on the Listen, train. I had no yeah. idea who he was. Yeah, I went right. home to tell my mother. And what I said, like, Mom, I met this guy, he wants me to be a model. <laughs> and she said, not that industry, full of funny people. <laughs> I didn't know what funny people meant again until now. <laughs> so yeah, I think she meant, yeah, gay. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> but Simon was a gentleman and he really, sort of looked after me, mentored me, introduced me to ID Magazine, right. where I met Terry and Trisha Jones. And ID Magazine really was a magazine by young people, for young people. So I started sort of 1990, I was the fashion director. And yeah, it was just really speaking to a generation. And, and this is the covers with the, I won't try and wink because I can't really the, wink. the winks, yes. right? And the yeah, it's always a wink, a girl winking on the cover, which is the typographic ID. So I dot no smile, ID. Turned oh, upside yeah. down. Okay, right. Try it at home <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> um, so it was, a, it was a really, really great time, you know. I, I, had, I always say, for me, it's so important to mentor 
young people because had I not been mentored, I wouldn't be here, you know. So I had people who really encouraged me, encouraged a lot of foolish ideas, you know, kind of a lot of foolish photo shoots. And I learned from my mistakes. And yeah, the beauty of ID was I didn't have an assistant. I think I got paid something like 7,000 pounds a year, which to me was a lot, <laughs> you know. And yeah. I learned everything, you know, I'd work, I'd shoot covers, I'd style covers, I'll write cover lines, I'd go shopping to do the shopping pages. I'd well, write well, copy. Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. like a one man army. Yeah. I'd be in the <laughs> art department trying to sort of really sort of upset the art directors, never yeah. happy with the layout. But then we have this ID roving nights. So you go to Scotland at night or Newcastle, all, all, all over England, and where you sell the magazine and try to get advertising for me. Oh, my God, so you're selling the thing yeah. on the street as well. <laughs> right. It so really, really everything I learned then, I use now. Right, okay, still yeah. selling it. And then the styling, so ID, and then from there, you get absorbed in, well, I don't know if that's the right word, but it'd be yeah. into the fashion world, and yeah. you have this sort of incredible, so what was the step? So I, very vivid descriptions of the sort of, you know, the terror of meeting Calvin Klein oh, in New sure. York and the yeah. rails in the sort of, you know, so, so you go from this, the kid who's putting yeah. all this operation together to being top level serious sort of New York. How was that transition? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, I, you know, in London, sort of in the 90s, all my friends, sort of Craig McDean, David Sims, um, Jürgen Teller, we were all kids and we sort of created a movement called Grunge. That's what they called it, the press label, the yeah, Grunge, but it was about reality. And Kate Moss was our queen. So what happened was Kate was take, you know, taken to America by Calvin and all the photographers went to work for, for Vogue. At the time, I didn't like Vogue then, because they took all the best talent. And we had, you know, we would find them and then Vogue would take them. Oh, and, I see, okay. And then I remember yeah. in 96, Calvin came calling. Um, he liked the work we've been doing in London, so I had to go and meet him to sort of to style the CK campaigns. He had a new line, and um, this is Ronnie Newhouse. Yes, this, this with Ronnie yeah. Newhouse, yes. who okay. came to London so, to meet us, yeah. and off we went. And it was very strange indeed. Strange, strange people. And there's a few ups and downs, isn't there? There's a story where you have the rails and the all the wrong clothes are on it or something there's sort of yeah I mean you know, I walked in you know yeah. I mean I'm from London you know <laughs> the most clothes I'd ever take on a shoot was a plastic bag yeah. or secondhand clothes or clothes you'd customize <laughs> Amanda knows the story <laughs> and then I walked in I was confronted with racks and racks of clothes and boxes and I remember turning around to Ronnie Neal and I said who's supposed to unpack those boxes and she said you I, I, I was very shocked yeah <laughs> But it was a whole different world, and I learned so much. And I remember, I was, you know, Kate and I would spend hours locked into a room to put, you know, to put clothes together, which is really what I loved. Yeah. You know, but everything around it was just too much work. Right. But anyway, <laughs> America really groomed me, really sort of taught me how to be a stylist. Because in London, we were just doing, you know, fun we didn't, you know, we just played, and we just did what we wanted to do. But in America, there was structure, you know, there was, you know, edit this, you know, 20 racks, edit down to six, and this is supposed to be the message. And so I learned a lot about fashion, sort of moving to the next level, really. How do you know? Do you just know when you know? Do you just play it with it and when you're styling? You yeah. know, you, but you also have this amazing um, thing where you sort of, you know, I was just trying to think how to put it, you're, you, sort of, you sort of dream fashion shoots. Yeah. I mean, literally. Literally. So, yeah, I remember I sort of <laughs> growing up and, you know, we was, we, I started going to the shows and most stylists would see that yellow dress and they would f put it in a shoot and a picture. And I remember I would see that same yellow dress and I would just go blank. And I really used to hide it thinking there was something wrong because I just couldn't take these clothes from the shows and create stories with them. But what I could do was I could look at the clothes and I could go to sleep and I would wake up and I would see every image. Pretty much it is there, Albert, no. Every image as it should be, almost like a photograph of a model, what they should be wearing, the location, everything. And I used to hide it for years and I used to think I was cheating. <laughs> I think it was cheating until you know, someone said, I think that's a gift. And to this day, you know, if I, <clears throat> if I can't see that, I can't, if I can't visualize it that way, 
I can't do it. So everything I do, I have to sort of be able to see it even before I start the process. I know, there's For also sure. a sort of narrative thread. I think you likened it at one point to silent movie directing, yes. where I, you know, some of those shoots like, you know, the Italian Vogue will come onto that in a minute, or Angelina Jolie, they really stick in one's mind because there's a story. So is yeah. that all in the sleep as well, or is that sort of... I mean, for me, I, <clears throat> I, I love the movies, and like, I couldn't right. understand why fashion couldn't be like movies. So for me, you know, just, let's go back to that yellow dress again. For me to start a fashion story, I have to have a character. So that character is your model, um, your actress, so the character defined, and I have to sort of think of where they exist. It could be Cliveden, it could be in a house in London, it could be, I don't know, somewhere in Scotland. Then the location's next for me. So I have a character, I have a location, and once the character's been clearly defined, mm. then the clothes come in. Right. And it's the easiest right. thing at that point. And is it, what level of brain is this happening? Is this a conscious exercise or is this just kind it's, of it's just how, It's up? just how I, I always, just how I know to work. I mean, mm. everyone's got their sort of different ways, but I need, even if it's a simple picture, I need to have an idea behind it. It can't just be a girl standing there in a beautiful dress, yeah. you know. And yeah. it's really torturous. So <laughs> sometimes it's... Um, it's quite difficult sometimes, but yeah, it's the only way I know. But you're also incredibly driven. I mean, there's this very impressive, I love this thread in this book where you are, you, you are going to work for Italian Vogue. And, yeah. you know, it's sort of not easy. It's sort of not happening. And, you know, there's, how long is it? Is it months? Is it years? You sort of, I don't know. I mean, I remember, so Craig McDean, the photographer I worked with, was sort of grabbed by American Vogue and Italian Vogue. And I was obsessed with Italian Vogue. I love Franca Sanzani, and every month I would look at the covers and, you know, Stephen Meisel, who's really one of my closest mm -hmm. friends and one of the photographers I work with the most, would be shooting these incredible covers. And I wondered why I couldn't work for Italian <laughs> Vogue. And, you know, I willed it and I willed it and, <laughs> and I, I literally would press Craig McDean, like you ha we have to shoot for Italian Vogue. But I wouldn't okay. stop. And then one day, Franca gave us a commission. With he Craig said, you know, Yeah, Craig yeah. comes like, you know what? I spoke to yeah. Franca about yeah. you, and we have a commission to shoot a story. So I remember I was kind of in New York a lot at the time, and I was obsessed with all how women, you know, I don't know if they still do it in New York, but women would go to work in, in trainers. They'll have yeah. a bag, and the minute they got to the office, they'll take the trainers off and put the heels on. Yeah. So I sort of formulated a story called Walking, and it was all these women running around New, New York with bread, sort of in paper bags and high heels, and, and I really loved the story. And then, you know, a month later, Franca had a party in Milan, and I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to love me. <laughs> and if you know Franca Sanzani, she was, she, was, she was incredible, but very tough. And I remember walking up to Franca, and I was like, Franca, I'm Edward. And she gave me the look of death. <laughs> <laughs> Literally looked, looked me up and down. I remember running back to a friend of mine and said, like, oh my God, Franca just literally ignored me. So my friend took me over and introduced me. She said, oh my God, I love your story. And from that moment, she would give, every time I'd go to her, Franca, I have eight ideas. Of course, I was very, not one or two ideas, eight. Yeah. Frank, I yeah. have eight ideas, and she, and she, I would always, she'd always say, do, 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 do. So that became yeah. my conversation with Franca always, do. Yeah. So she was really great, and then she introduced me to Stephen Meisel, and yeah. Yeah. Another career began. Uh, but sort of, it, it always, uh, you, the, you've risen up the levels, and, but it just tips into something a little kind of, you know, more difficult, doesn't it? You become a workaholic, and yeah. you know, fashion does have this, you know, underside, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, this kind of, you know, the drugs, the the parties can very easily get yeah. a bit sort of manic, and you had to sort of have your own fight through that. How did you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I started when I was eighteen, yeah. and into my, in my twenties, I was well. I mean, my my routine was go to work, work till really late go with my friends, we go out, repeat. Yeah. And from 18 to my 20s, we just went out. You know, we, 
It wasn't even work. It was just we we were together all the time. You know, we you never sort of left. You became party central, didn't you? You yes. said wherever you were, that you know, sort of you could leave work, and then everybody turns up. Yeah, everybody in your turns place. up in yeah. the office. You know, I remember I'll be in the office, but I'll never have a moment on my own. There were always people sitting around the desk, sort of up and coming actors or dancers. So that became life, you know. And I realized as I was progressively to my twenties that there was something, you know, I would work. I mean, I would never let work suffer, but I would work through illness, because you know, we'll come to that, I'm sure. Yes. I'd work through, I don't know, depression. I would work, you know, work became sort of everything that held everything together because growing up, you know, I was always told you have to work 10 times as hard to, as a black, per black person to achieve what you need to achieve. So whatever I did, I had to show up and work to the detriment of my health, my mental sort of well-being. And I remember sort of in my early 30s, waking up one day and thinking, I have to stop this. You know, I was, I mean, I was really broken. I was really sort of just depressed all the time. And, you know, th th there's a saying, you can be in a room surrounded by a thousand people and still feel lonely. And that was happening more and more. I wasn't really enjoying my work. So I, I decided to stop drinking and um, I joined AA. My early 30s. Wow. And yeah. how long do you, are you still in AA or did you? I was in AA for a long time, 14 years. Yeah. And people always ask, what's that like? And really all it teaches you is that, you know, people are equal. You have to treat everybody with respect. You have to, you know, you, you do develop a spiritual side, which is, you know, just embrace people. Um, Always try to see the good side of people. I mean, all those old-fashioned things that you read about, which you know we we don't think is so cool mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. But it really grounded me because you would be in the room and it would be you know the guy next to you would be a homeless person, and you'd be sort of watching the teacups together, mm -hmm. and you could, you'd be the head of Merrill Lynch or whatever, and, and it was just mm -hmm. really leveling and really humbling. And, and to go back a little bit on, on how you got there, so you know, this is a fashion scene, but there was also, it was, we were talking earlier about how sort of difficult it was really, you say you had to work twice as hard or whatever. Did, did you, that was always said, was, did you also feel it to be true? Did you I mean, I always, forward? you know, it's all I knew. It's, you know, right. we had to flee one country to come to another yeah. country. And we had, I had parents who just instilled, put so much importance in work. So even when I started ID as a teenager, failing was not an option. And I would do whatever I had to do to get where I needed to get to. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was just part of my DNA, I suppose. And when you, you started the nightclub scene, you said that was very difficult. In, in, yeah, back then it was kind of... In the book I talk about, you know, you, yeah. you sort of grow up so, twice as a gay right, person. Right. You know, first you, you have your problems at home. So, you know, all of you with gay kids or, you know, um, kids who you think might be gay, it's very difficult when you leave home. You're like, okay, I've lost one family. And then you, you, you discover the gay world. You think, mm. I've found another family. Mm. But within that, you realize that, I realized there were so many rules, you know? Mm. Um, I remember sort of going to the nightclubs and if there was a, a guy who liked black guys, they called them a dinch queen. But does that mean I'm dingy, dirty? I don't know. If they liked Indian guys, they were curry queens. And if mm. you liked East Asian men, you were rice queen. And so I walked into <laughs> a scene with it, but I knew I didn't want to be anybody's fantasy. I didn't want any part of that. So I had to surround myself mm. with sort of really good friends and family mm. to be able to navigate that, yeah. which was a whole new world in itself. Yeah. And, and it sounds so sort of difficult and kind of strange. And I can see how you were com anyone would be unprepared mm. for that. But, and you, we haven't mentioned for a while your, your mother is this sort of wonderful figure from whom you've learned so much. How are relations with your father? So when we last mentioned him, you were going to be a lawyer. Yeah. Now then what? I mean, my father was a military man, um, an African military man. You know, he yeah. was in the... He was in the Peace Corps, the Ghanaian Peace Corps, so he would go to Liberia, wherever there was war. You know, yes. him and his macho colleagues would go and try and sort of tone things down. And yes. he really didn't have much time for me. You know, I was very sensitive, I was very quiet, very shy. I was always with my mother. 
And, you know, I'll always be sketching and I'll see him and I'll literally fold it up and oh. throw it away or he'll grab it and throw it away. I guess he knew then that there was something very different about me that I didn't, I didn't realize. But I was just very sensitive and I was really scared of him. And there's a very so over the years, thing. our relationship got really strained. The old, you know, as I got older, he didn't want me to model. So my mother was like, just go. You know? So my father and I had a very strained relationship. But at the same time, you know, I got the rigor from him. I got you know, being super organized from him. But there's very dramatic scenes in the book. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and down where everything gets thrown out the window at one yeah. point, doesn't it? What's that? You're leaving. So I've, like, I've been. I mean, literally. I, I, I started at Goldsmiths University. Yeah. Um, I got in, and I'd been pretending to my dad that I was going to university. But I was really hanging out in Labrador Grove, hanging out with Kay, hanging out with my friends, photo shoots, ID. And I remember going to college, one, university one day, and um, you actually the, 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 yeah. the, the tutor said, oh, yeah. you know, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be in fashion. Look at what I've done already, you know, showed her a few test sheets. And she was literally like, what are you doing here? Because you're doing what we want all our students to eventually end up doing. So I stopped going. But I didn't <laughs> tell my dad. So one day, I think he saw me. He saw me on the street when I was supposed to be yeah. at college, and I came home, and he just he said, "Well, you know, why aren't you at college?" And I just said, "I'm, I'm, I'm not going. I want to be in fashion. I want to work at ID." And out came the clothes through the window: <laughs> biker boots, cycling <laughs> shorts, <laughs> Cafe Hamlet T-shirts, and um, I remember sort of picking everything up. But in my mind. Saying, I'm, you know, as a teenager, I'm, I'm not, never coming back. I'll do whatever I have to do to make sure I never came back. And that same day, I walked into ID Magazine and the fashion director, Beth Summers, literally said, I'm leaving and you're taking over. So, yeah, special. But over time, you know, and then you go on this sort of path with your father. So your, you know, your mother who's, was always supportive and then you get so and so busy and then eventually, you know, her health, and tell us how you sort of, you did come back to your father, really, when he came yeah, back so to I mean, you know, my mother, how did they, you? you know, I left home, you know, I, I didn't stay in touch with my mother so much, I, I, you know, I was in a new world, I had new friends, and my mother had a stroke, I think when she was 52, quite oh, early, so quite young, young. Oh. and she was paralyzed for a long, long, long time, 15 years, and I saw my father go from this hard sort of military man to this man who just literally would take care of her morning, noon, without a nurse, take care of her morning, noon, and night and really care for her. So I just sort of started seeing a softer side. And as the years went on, you know, hello became hello, how are you? And it became, I'm fine, thank you. And very slow. And then, you know, I realized that he did the best he could. You know, he came from one country where he was sort of very well respected to another country where he was essentially unemployed and couldn't work. And, you know, he was such a proud man that he sort of took it out on the kids. And, yeah, so slowly, slowly we got together. And, and we're saying the idea of law was something he just wanted the best for you, really. Didn't no, he no. wanted you to sort no. of be... At the time, you know, I was so against him and everything he stood for. I mean, he was so macho. I mean, to this yeah. day, I have a thing against macho men, I have to be honest. You know, I like <laughs> sensitivity, I like... But he was yeah. so macho and yeah. everything I wasn't. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that was really a problem. And then also, you know, I just think of your current cover. There's sort of, I mean, I know you write that you had this nuanced idea of you know, the Commonwealth or royalty, yes. but when you get your OBE, he, he is, he, oh my God. It, it, yeah. yeah. I don't Tell even know, I mean, I've got an OBE is. for services yeah. to diversity and he, in fashion. So it's 2015, quite a while yeah. ago. But, and you know, my dad's always been so nonchalant, doesn't matter how many features I'd had in magazines, it didn't matter, he, he just pretended like he hadn't seen. <laughs> but I think when he heard about the OBE, I heard he was very happy about that. Yeah. So, you know, and the, you know I took him to Buckingham Palace and Princess Anne sort of gave me the medal. Yeah. And um, he was so, I mean, I heard from everyone he was crying. He was so proud, but he never told me. So to this day, 
Um, but apparently he was very happy, and I remember I had a party that night at um, the Marx Club, and I turned around, and there he was, Madonna to one side, and, the to, and boogieing away, and having the time of his life. So yeah, he was very, you know, I mean, we grew up in Ghana. I know about colonization. It's a very, yeah. it's a very sort of complex relationship between black people and, you know, colonization. But I also know that firsthand that I was allowed, we were allowed to come into England even without the right papers. Yeah. We came from the Commonwealth. Yeah. So I've always been sort of a fan of the Queen. And then I got to know Prince Charles. Yes. You know, even before I met Prince Charles, a lot of people in my neighborhood, my cousins, some of my brothers, who the world had given up on, were given sort of a step up by the Prince's Trust. Mm. So the Prince's Trust in my neighborhood was the thing that sort of gave you the help you needed. So when mm. I met Prince Charles and really saw how wonderful he was, mm. you know, I, 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 you know, yeah. And I you now it. are an ambassador for that. For yeah, I'm a global yeah. ambassador. It's an incredible for, kind yeah. of charity that, that he's really done, incredible. done, isn't it? And meanwhile, you had your own sort of health s struggles yourself, didn't yeah. you? Because, you know, as you say, we look at other people and we all think it's so kind of easy and seamless, but you had lots of oh issues. I mean, when you were little, one of the reasons you were so close to your mother yeah. was you were... I remember being really young and my mother, one of the reasons why my mother would always stay with me was because I, I have a blood disorder called sickle cell trait and also thalassemia. So every few months I would be in pain and I'll have to go to the hospital for blood transfusions. So that was me growing up. Mm. And then sort of later on, as I, in my working sort of life, um, I've never had great vision anyway. So I suffered ret retinal detachments. One, then two, then three, four times. You're but through it all, like, you know, I would just I'm work. Sorry. Right. You know, it, like I remember having a retinal detachment, having surgery, and the next day, sort of taking off the brain. You're supposed to stare down. Every time you have a retinal detachment, have a surgery, they put, a, they put gas in your eyes, and you have to literally face downwards for three weeks. Can you imagine? Three weeks times four yeah. surgeries. Yeah. But I remember I got up, unstrapped, and literally the next day I'm sitting there in Nick Knight's studio being interviewed. But that's what the fashion industry, you know, when you, when you start in any industry young, you know, Sometimes you're programmed and you don't even realize, like, I have to show up for work. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm on my deathbed, I, bed, I have to show up. So that's something I had to learn to unlearn. But yeah. You've learned so much. Can you just give, I know there are some young people here, I, you know, your advice. I feel like you've really learned how to sort of navigate so yeah. much. Could you, what would you say to the you know, 18-year-old, 20-year-old. Yeah. I mean, what I'll say to you, you know, young people is, you have to be fearless. That's the first thing. You have to be fearless. Whatever, a lot of people will tell you you're wrong. A lot of people will tell you, oh, you can't do this. I remember being 18 and someone saying to me, when you go into an institution and they say, oh, we don't do things like that or like this, just say, why? <laughs> That's simple, that one word, why? Why can't we try something else? Why should it be that way? So, you know, also find your tribe. You know, I had a great group of people around, you know, when I was growing up. If I was depressed, I could call, you know, Pat. So find a, find a great group. Also believe, that I think there's a tendency for people to think, oh, if there's a trend, I have to go with that trend. In, in photography, or just find your own voice. And I know it's very hard to say to a young person, find your own voice, but that's what I really did. I just listened to what was inside. And that's really what carried me from my teenage years to now. And, and it, young people don't have it easy now. Mm. You know, it's such a different world. We didn't, have the, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have everybody watching every move we made. We didn't have, you know, me looking at someone's life and thinking it was better. It's, it, I, I couldn't be a kid tonight, could you? Mm. No, probably not. I, I mean, mean my, no. I take my hat off no, to no. all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you have yeah. to really just be fearless and, you know, I always say, you know, try to apprentice, whatever you choose to do, whether it's photography, whether it's try to work with somebody, make contact, see how it's done. And really that's the only advice I can give. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, I mean, we'll go on. We've got so many questions. I mean, I've got more questions, but I want other people to get to have a turn. But 
you know, thank you so much, everyone. That's a wonderful talk. And this is a, a really wonderful and surprising and sort of moving block and a huge achievement for you. But now, now I think we'll open the floor for some uh, thank um, you for having questions. Me. So, uh, have we got our microphones here? Okay, should we go to the lady here? Hi, thank you so much for joining. Can, can you hear me okay? translate for me. Okay, I will, yes. Yes, Thanks. so um, my question is about just sort of the contradiction of a few times you've said failure is not an option and you chose this field where you were rejected all of the time early on and you faced that down without hesitation and you talk about you know confronting norms. I just wanted to know what that force inside of you is that um, creates that sort of um, boldness and how you've become that type of person. Okay, so basically he's talking about sort of failure is not an option. Do you mind if I summarise it? Yes. I think what you're bad hearing. really Tentative. saying is why, how are you so fearless? How are you so, what made you so brave? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, like I, I said, you know, when you leave your home, when you go to a strange place where you have to survive, you've already lost your home, you've already lost what you know, then you get kicked out of home into a new, another new place where you're rejected again. I have nothing to lose, you know, you just have, I'm like, this has happened to me, what's the worst that can happen? You know, okay. what, that I don't have money, that I don't have friends, you know, so I'm just gonna go for what I believe and, yeah, so that was really instilled in me from a very young age, you know. I've, drive, I've already lost everything. And where does the drive come from? So there's the fearlessness and the drive. Is that the same thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, now when I look back, I must have been really driven. But I guess in the beginning, it was the idea of never going back home and mm. giving my dad the satisfaction. That was really <laughs> true. <laughs> right, <laughs> that he just okay. came back. He couldn't survive. And then, you know, I just... I just wanted to, I was so in love with the industry. I was so in love with the fashion industry, the world of media, and I just, I just soaked it up. And, you know, to this day, I don't really sleep much. I sleep, what, five hours? And, and I, every minute was just so many ideas, so many things to do, so many things to shoot, so many people to meet. So that really spurred me on. Just, it didn't feel like work. Right. You know, it didn't it feel like work. Thing. Okay. Another one. Natalie, oh, because, sorry. That was amazing, thanks so much. One of the things that really struck me was when you said, you know, in order to, in your modeling career, you had to deal with the rejection, rejection, rejection. What I'm fascinated by is how you managed to pick yourself up. Because didn't Hillary Clinton said, it's not about how many times you fall, yeah. it's about how you pick yourself yeah. up. What advice would you give someone, a young person who is experiencing rejection? Yeah. How do they get up and try again? Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, you know, I was rejected so many times, but I had great people around me. I had a great, you know, my brothers were great. I still had my mother, you know. There were days where I'd go home and I'd feel so horrible. And, you know, just surround yourself with great people. I mean, had I been a little bit older, I would have gone to therapy. But I didn't know what that was back then, <laughs> you know. But really... It, it, it's not easy being young, I know that, and you just have to surround yourself with as many good people as you, as you can. People who can pick you up when you're down, not just people who are there when there's a party, because there are a lot of those, right? <laughs> but the people who will take the time to come and see you when you're not feeling so great, and, you know, advise you in the right way, you know, and right. I had quite a few of them. Cool. Okay, next question. Plum? Can we? Okay, let's go here and then here. Yeah, this Sorry. About how you found your tribe um, and how much of finding your tribe is down to coincidence and um, what did you sacrifice to find the right tribe and do you think that you have to keep searching to find it um, still now and um, when should you embarrass yourself to be different and when should you allow yourself to fit in and find a good place to fit in? Okay, there's a lot going on there. Did you hear any of that? So Nothing. I'm going to start off with the beginning, if you don't mind. So it was a question about your tribe and how you found them. And did you uh, have to sacrifice anything in order to find your tribe, right? So let's start with that. Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting question, actually. Yeah, it is, actually. isn't it? So the, 
I mean, I, you know, I think that, you know, when you meet people who are like-minded, you kind of know. Um, you know, when I met the makeup artist, Pat McGrath, she was a sort of a music makeup artist, and I thought, oh, I like you, you're funny, and you're talented, so let's go. And then when I met Naomi for the first time, I never, I mean, the first time I met Naomi is a funny story. You know, I, I met her in Paris, I had 20 pounds in my pocket, and she said, I have a private plane, let's go to Dublin for the weekend. <laughs> I'm like, with what money? So I had to, you know, but I liked that energy, and, and Kate was always so sweet, and so you, you, you know, you know when you meet someone you want to spend a lot of time with, and yes, you know, at, at the, I guess at the expense of my family. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't want right. to spend any time with my family when I met, them, when I met right. my friends. You know, <laughs> I, I was in this world, they were so glamorous and beautiful, and we were all so exciting, and family was boring, but then, <laughs> As the years go and I realize, yes. oh my God, what really made me who I am is my family. It's family. You know. Yeah. Okay. But kids will always rebel anyway. So. <laughs> That's true. Cool. Plummy, can we go here? Thank you. Oh, Hi, Edward. That was so interesting. Thank you. So my question is actually sort of on behalf of everyone who wants to um, improve their wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So all the ladies here. Um, if money is absolutely no object, so forgetting any money constraints, if there was just three things <laughs> that we should own in our life, could you please tell me what they are? That's easy. <laughs> and I'm not just saying this because I'm in this room. You need a Chanel jacket or bag. Hey. Right? And I really mean that, a Chanel jacket or bag. A good pair of jeans will always work. And I always say, you know, in this, in this age of yeah. sustainability, just buy a good piece of jewelry because you can wear it with jeans, you can wear it to make yourself feel happy when the days are not so good, you can wear it on bad days, good days. So those were the three things I'll say. A Chanel jacket or bag, a pair of jeans, and lovely jewelry. How's that? Great. No, it's great. It's really great. Okay. Okay. Oh, you've got a Chanel jacket on. I've got, I know, yeah. as, as luck would have it. Amanda's here too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Taking a jacket off, but we'll be um, Over here, so should we go the lady in the second row and then the standing up? Thing. So I want, oh, is it working? Hello, hello, testing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, up until now, and I'm sure you've got a few years left, um, what's been the best moment of your life? Oh, best moment. <laughs> Oh, okay. Is that the question? The best yeah. moment of my life? Uh, I've, got, I've just reminded oh, me I've got another that's question. A, that's a good one. There's been many, many moments, let's say. Um, I can list a few of them. Um, sort of getting my first modeling job was one. Getting my job at ID was another. Getting my job at British Folk was, an, was another one. Um, I don't know the birth of the birth of my nieces and my godchildren. Oh, right. um, too many to mention. Okay. Really, it's just those moments yes. where you feel really lifted and really joyful. Yeah. And those moments don't happen so often, as we know. Lovely. So yeah, it's normally those moments. This lady standing up there with it. The... Edward, you're amazing, and you're a total icon of our time. Um, you were the first uh, editor, black editor of Vogue. And to my mind, you've had a huge impact on fashion globally in terms of how black beauty has been seen in the mainstream. Do you, are you happy with the status quo? Is there more to be done? I uh, so she's saying you're a total icon and you've also had an amazing sort of impact in the fashion industry on how- I love beauty. <laughs> <laughs> you're really working today. <laughs> On, on, on how, uh, how black beauty is seen, and are you happy with where it's got to, or is there more to be done? Yeah. I mean, there's always more to be done, isn't there? Right. But I, I remember 2017 when I started at British Vogue, and really the, the, the conversation, the industry, and you've been an editor, is that black yeah. models don't sell on covers. Yeah, that was, We've proven yeah. that wrong with you know, covers with Naomi, Rihanna, Beyonce. But for me, more than anything, even going beyond sort of you know, black. For me, it's just about people who didn't feel seen. And by that, I mean people of all different races, all women, 
of all different shapes and sizes, religions, socioeconomic backgrounds, age. I felt that all these people who felt so othered, who didn't fit the idea of a fashion magazine needed to be embraced. So I'm really proud to say when you pick up British Vogue every month, everybody's represented, but in, of course in the chicest, most <laughs> Very important, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, everybody's sort of represented and also, you know, the industry now, it's amazing to see so many black models on other covers in, you know, fashion shows and I think, you know, the work that needs to be done now is behind the scenes because, you know, it's, it's really easy to say, oh, it's all good, you know, Edward's made it, so everyone's mm. made it, so that's not really the really case, we like need it. to give more internships, you know, more bursaries for people of colour. You know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done still, but for now, we're sort of heading in the right direction. Okay, anyone else? We've got some in the middle here. Um, sorry, I can't quite see, just in the middle of that row. Um, hi, Edward. You hi. truly are the inspiration to our younger generation and then those many more with it. But my question to you, perhaps is a fairly simple one, but what advice would you give to an aspiring stylist um, or creative director? You, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to have to say it again, even if I do look like a fool. But <laughs> okay. you're an inspiration. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> book for which, and advice for very specifically an aspiring stylist or yes. an aspiring creative director. A little bit more advice. Yeah. What advice would I give? Yes. You know, like I said, you know, follow your path, create your own voice. Also, keep bugging people like me. Don't stop. <laughs> You know, one day I will see you, or the editor from L, or Richard from Tatler, somebody will see you. But you really have to believe, because I know that styling is, might sound glamorous, but I know the hours you have to put in and not really have any financial sort of benefits. I know the hours, the money you have to spend on photo shoots just to get what you need. You know, you actually spend, everything that comes in goes out. But I'll just say, you know, just keep, keep networking, you know, keep your, vi your vision intact, and really just up knock on as many doors as you can, like I did with Franca. Mm, this book is yeah. actually very good guidance for that. I mean, boy, is it, there's not survival. giving up. Yeah, and not giving up, you know. She not had no up. option not giving up. in the end. Right. She had to have you in that magazine, or I don't know what would have happened to her, but um, anything else? Anyone else? Um, I can't see. Yes, da down here. We'll have one more, and then I'm going to be really naughty and ask you something else that I wanted to. I love this room. I know, isn't it great? <laughs> it's sort of. Um... Um, firstly, thank you so much for today. It's been really interesting. Um, my question is: You have so many incredible ideas. I love going through the magazine. How do you pick which ideas to focus on and kind of strategize that? Okay. Over to you. So, um, it, it was. You have so many incredible ideas. How do you pick them? How do you strategize? How do you choose which ones to? In terms of the magazine? Yeah. In terms well, of well, you know, I have a great book. team. You know, I've been able to sort of have a, a team who really sort of believe in sort of inclusivity, in you know, diversity. Who really believe that the world Vogue can have can change the world in its own small way. So, you know, we really strategize. It's always about people in the zeitgeist, um, people making a difference, you know, women making a change, sort of changing the world in, the, in their own little ways. You know, you don't have to be Michelle Obama to be noticed, but are just people who really are trying to make a difference, mm. you know? And also the most, you know, the most glamorous, fan, fantasy, vogue women that we, we love sort of through the years. Mm. So it really, de it really depends on the month, like this month, we had a cover ready to go, and then, you know, Her Majesty passed, mm. and we had to stop everything to really create this incredible tribute to her. And, you know, you have to also have to be able to pivot, because sometimes you can have ideas, and they're mm. all lined up to go, but you have to scrap them. Mm. You shouldn't be able to scrap ideas and start again. I mean, mm. I've I mean, Albert will tell you. Mm. I've been in front of the board, the issue's about to go off, and I would literally scrap stories, <laughs> chop things up, throw things yeah. out, move things around. But that's really part of the job, really. Just, you have to go with your instincts. And the team are wonderful, so. What more from me, sort of, you know, uh, what, what's next for you? There we are, we were talking about this, you know, Vogue, 
how do you see the future for you or the oh, that's magazine? A question, or isn't the, it? Yeah, that is a big question. When you write a book, everyone thinks, bye, he's off, see you later. <laughs> oh, well, no, I hope you're not. But, you know, um, I, you know to... look, I'm, I'm very it's happy sort of doing what I'm doing now at British Vogue, sort of working with the European um, editors. We have all these amazing editors in Spain, Germany, Italy, and France that I have to oversee. And you know, I just really, so long as it's creative, I'm really into sort of creativity still. Um, I'm not really that into, you know, the, what, 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 how, we, how do we put it sort of nicely? Uh, the corporate man, side. Right, yeah. But um, you know, I need to be creative. Maybe there might, there might be sort of producing in, in the future, directing, just things that I've always wanted to do. But for now, yeah, I'm very happy. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Edward. Thank you for having me.